Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the Cinema of Ideas, the Independent Cinema Office's virtual screen, a forum for conversations about cinema, film culture, and more. My name is Sami Abgarazak, and I'm a marketing officer here at the ICO. For anyone who needs a visual description, I'm a man in my 20s with brown hair, wearing a mustard shirt, and I'm in my bedroom. Uh, a special welcome to audiences from our partner cinemas across the UK, and thank you to our funder for this project, the BFI, awarding funds from the National Lottery. Uh, so, uh, a few housekeeping things to mention before we start. This event is being live captioned. Uh, this should appear automatically on your screen. Uh, this event is also being recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel in due course. Uh, if you head there, you can find an archive of previous cinema of ideas talks there as well. Uh, tonight's discussion will last around 45 minutes, with time left at the end for questions from you, the audience. But please do feel free to post these in the chat throughout the session, and we'll come to them at the end. Uh, I hope many of you have had a chance to watch the two films in this event already, but if not, uh, you have until this Friday to do so. They include Lucille Hagsett Halliburton's short film, Gang of Chura, which follows a peaceful walk taken by two young children in the middle of nature, and offers a beautifully crafted view of our relationship with wild nature from the perspective of a child's eye. The second film is The Moon and the Sledgehammer, a fascinating documentary from 1971, which captures the strange existence of the pages. A family living a simple life in the Sussex woodlands without running water, electricity or gas. During the film, we see it beyond the family's eccentricities, their words hint at a wise scepticism about society's relationship with the planet and its attitude towards the land, work and technology. But on to tonight's discussion. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Julia Brown, who will be hosting this conversation. Julia is the founder of No Planet B, an arts organisation which inspires environmental activism through film and culture. So, hello, Julia. Um, and then I'm pleased to introduce Troy Vacase and Drew Pendergrass, authors of Half Earth Socialism, which will be the subject of tonight's conversation. Half Earth Socialism offers a vision of a future free from extinction, climate change, and pandemics for a reimagined society which includes a rapid transition to renewable power uh, and drastic cuts in energy use by the world's wealthiest, global veganism, rewilding of half of the earth and a worldwide socialist planning system. So uh, thanks very much for joining us this evening, Troy and Drew. And there is a bit. Uh, so thankfully that is all from me and we can now get into the discussion. So I will now hand over to you, Julia, and I will disappear for the time being. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Julia Brow and for a visual description, I'm a white woman in my late twenties with straight brown hair and I'm wearing a flowery dress with a navy blue cardigan. Um, as Sami said, I run No Planet B. Uh, no Planet B hosts film screenings and has produced zines and multimedia projects all on environmental themes. Uh, but for tonight's event, uh, we'd like to start by sharing our reflections on the films in the Cinema Ideas Life in the Woods event, which is run by the ICO. Um, as Sami said, if you haven't had the chance to watch the films yet, they're available to watch for a few more days. Um, Drew, would you like to introduce yourself and start with your reflections as well? Sure. Yes. So for people needing a visual description, I'm a white man in my 20s in a kind of a speckled purple shirt. Um, these were really wonderful films, so I'd encourage people to to watch them. Um, one of my uh, first things that struck me about the uh, Moon and the Sledgehammer film is how much it reminded me of certain people I grew up around in Alabama in the southeastern U.S. Uh, it's an area um, that seemed remarkably similar, like uh, the air, the people who have stuff all over their yard tinkering things off. I knew some people who built old Model T cars who would be driving around in these ancient hundred year old vehicles. This sort of idea of praising um, craftsmanship. There's a big uh, emphasis on um, quality of work. Um, some of the characters uh, in the film complain about shoddy factory work in the modern 
sequel in the 1970s at the time of the film uh, and contrast it with um, more quality construction. There's a scene where one of the women in the family is embroidering these beautiful uh, peacock um, fabric. Uh, that's really an extraordinary um, piece of craftsmanship. Um, another thing that struck me about this these films, um, and in particular, the Moon and the Sledgehammer film was a critique of a certain form of arrogance that was made by uh, the characters at a certain point. There was a, there was a moment where um, uh, one of the pages talks about how it's a good thing that the moon is out of the way because otherwise he might hit it with the sledgehammer uh, by accident, but it's also good because if it was closer, people would take it down and try and sell it or something like that, make a fortune. And this would also lead to the ruin of the world, um, taking the moon down to make a fortune and would have the unintended consequence of destroying everything is sort of what he was getting at. Um, and he also, um, there's another moment where a different one of the pages is talking about, you know, we know so much about nature, we know so much about grass, but if you ask the scientist to produce a blade of grass, they would have no ability to do so. We can know about uh, plants, even very simple plants like grass that's everywhere, but we cannot reproduce it. There, there's something in our book that talks a lot about this Un inability of us to reproduce nature, even as we learn about it, that we can maybe get into later. So those are just two first uh, thoughts on the films. It's, I, I like this idea of these Model Ts in Alabama. I had no idea. So my name is Troy. Um, I'm in my mid thirties. Uh, I'm white and I'm wearing a white shirt and I'm sitting on a couch. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed both films. I think, um, especially, I mean, I would say both films were, were excellent. The short film that we saw, I think really did capture the, the wonder that children have. And I don't want to say anything too cliched, but I think the movie does do a good job actually you know, showing this is that how children you know, uh, care about nature, are connected to nature and how one, one loses that, uh, that connection. And it reminded me a little bit about how, you know, when you, you first tell a child you know, where meat comes from, they're horrified that you have to kill an animal. And I think there is this empathy and interest in nature that we lose and, and uh, one has to protect it or rekindle it as adults. And we get into this in the book uh, as well as in we need to have this sublime attachment, but also not just sublime, but also like quotidian everyday, you no know, wonder uh, for the world. So, and then um, for the, the moon and sledgehammer, um, uh, no film. I what, what Drew said about the moon being commodified is funny because in some ways we're actually very close to that. I mean, uh, there are some city governments in China that want to create a second moon that will increase illumination uh, at, at night. This would be uh, Drew. Maybe you remember better than I do, but I, uh, using a string of satellites to create this kind of illumination. Uh, the other thing, of course, is you know efforts to privatize moon. Uh, property, right? And uh, to have mining on the moon, especially for helium-3, I believe, which is, uh, you know, might be useful for fusion and as a way station to uh, other areas of space exploration. I recently organized a conference on neoliberalism in the environment, which is what I mainly work on professionally. Uh, and there was a great presentation um, and uh, by, by, one, by one scholar there, and she was saying how you know, neoliberal think tanks have been interested in moon privatization and space privatization for 20 years or so. So we're actually not very far away uh, from this, this brutal future uh, that the Page family is worried about. And if I can just um, say one more comment, I suppose uh, there's a difference between uh, what we're interested in I suppose as you know, utopian socialist uh, scholars and what is exist, what is presented in this film, and I think the difference is you know, there's two ways to relate to a, a troubled world or a flawed world, and one is to go inward and create intentional communities um, where one can live out one's ideals, and one is uh, an alternative is try to just change society, and I think. Um, what this family is doing is, is to live according to you know, their own values and uh, they are doing lots of things that perhaps we would agree with such as like a very low impact you know a, a way of living you know uh, emphasis on artisanal work and, and so forth um, but I suppose uh, the question of course comes down to scale like how do we create uh, a world that has energy quotas or um, can actually 
be sustainable ecologically at a, at a mass scale? Like, how do we create a page family like on mass in some ways? And and some things, of course, would be different. It'd be uh, it'd be a reliance on renewable energy rather than these really ancient steam engines and so forth. But I think um, there's a difference between this this utopian family and something like William Morris's view of the future, which is uh, a very socialized version of uh, an artisanal simple life. Thank you both for your reflections. And um, I don't have a lot to add, but in terms of De Natura, the short film and the program, I really agree with you, Troy. It catches this uh, childlike joy that's associated with being in nature. And I think it's something that is, it's not available to everyone, um, even as a child, that you're not always allowed to go and play alone like that. And I feel like um, the contrast of the children playing and eating fruit with the the natural processes of rotting and the insects kind of gathering. It reminded me of uh, more like mainstream nature documentaries when you see the time lapse of everything um, rotting and the regrowth. It kind of puts the children in their place within the natural world, which I really liked. Um, it also reminded me of uh, some of the feature films by Alice uh, Rovaka, um, such as The Wonders and Happy as Lazaro. Um, I don't know if you've seen those, but they're beautiful, magical, realist stories that show people living on kind of the margins of capitalist society. And they really give a sense of country life as being quite rustic and appealing and somewhat idealized. Um, but I really find them very evocative. So I recommend those to anyone else who um, enjoys Dinner Chira. And in terms of the moon and the sledgehammer, I, I really agree that it's, it represents this family living on the fringes and it's perhaps not always the most appealing if you're trying to engage people or persuade people to make lifestyle changes en masse. Um, some of it looks idyllic and some of it a little too rustic. <laughs> and definitely the hunting game uh, versus the your proposal of widespread veganism is quite a, a stark difference. Uh, but I definitely think there's a lot of parallels between um, the moon and the sledgehammer and half a socialism. Uh, so let's launch into some of the ideas that you explore in your book. Um, I found it really interesting that you chose to bookend half a socialism with uh, a dystopian future, sort of what will happen in the immediate decades um, if we do nothing and make poor choices, uh, both in terms of individual and uh, global policy decisions. Um, and then you show towards the end of the book uh, what an eco-socialist uh, utopia could look like in day-to-day -day life. Um, I found this very evocative and engaging, but I'm wondering what made you decide to structure the book in this way? I don't know if we really made so many decisions as we were writing. It was a very chaotic process writing this book. Uh, and we kept rewriting chapters uh, again and again. Um, true. Do you know how it came to us to write it? I mean, also, the, even the fourth chapter initially was supposed to be just a few paragraphs for the conclusion, and then Drew just kept writing and then it became a, became a chapter. But um, I'm, I'm not really sure. Drew, what do, you, what do you remember? Yeah, I think the the idea of the one of the things we wanted to do with the book, there's been many, many books written that are criticized the current environmental crisis that try and lay out what are the causes of this crisis, lay out the scale of this crisis. And we can do a little bit of this discussion here, but we felt that this had been done. There's been books on the sixth mass extinction, which we are currently living through, sixth mass extinction in the history of earth, history of life on earth. This is very troubling and does not get as much attention as climate change, another massive crisis that we are living through. And um, and so there's lots of books that kind of outline the drivers of this that is driven by these environmental change and, and capitalism, right? Like half of all carbon emissions happened since 1990 when capitalism takes over the world, you know, for example. Um, but we felt like this critique had been made. Um, and so we wanted to make it in very condensed form in case people were not familiar. Um, so we wrote a sh short kind of fictional uh, projection of, of the next 10 years modeled on actually the first few chapter, first chapter of Silent Spring. Uh, where Rachel Carson outlines the effects of pesticides with a fictional story that combines scientific studies to demonstrate what would happen if these pesticides take over the world. And we do something similar where we take in reports from oil companies about their plans of extraction in the future, even optimistic plans about 
transition and look at maybe what might happen. Um, and in particular, we look at solar geoengineering, this idea of artificially cooling the planet by spraying sulfur into the stratosphere to simulate a permanent volcanic eruption that blots out part of the sun. Um, so we wanted to do that as like a condensed way to get this in, then get to our utopian angle. You know, our the meat of the book is is positive. Like, how can we maybe resolve this? Um, and that's I think maybe why uh, we have all these ideas, and then we want to sum it up in this opposite fiction, so that we don't have we don't leave people with this this negative story, and instead have a, a positive vision um, that could be critiqued or played with by others, but that is something real and and positive um, at the end. Could I add something to that? I mean, I think one thing um, and one reason why we wanted to write uh, a projection of you know neoliberal catastrophe over the next 25 years, and, and that includes yeah, geoengineering, as Drew said, but you know, other pandemics, more inequality, um, you know, more oil extraction, even though there may be more electric cars and so forth, uh, you know, high rates of extinction that we'd be. And these are, I think, fairly conservative um, guesses of what's going to happen. I think I, we can probably stand by this. I, I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be fairly accurate. If anything, it's going to be worse than that, because again, we were uh, we were nice to like the green growthers and the mainstream environmentalists. So they go, okay, even if they take power and they implement energy efficiency, you know, regulations and whatever in electric vehicles, it still won't be enough to to really uh, really to absolute declines uh, in carbon emissions or land use change and so forth. But um, I think it's it's annoying because lots of uh, environmentalists, they kind of say, well, you know, if we don't do things, then the human race will go extinct, right? And I mean, they think it's like this kind of absolute Armageddon is uh, counterposed to, you know, whatever they're proposing. And then that never seems to actually happen. I like, think it's get worse and worse. Like we're in much worse shape than we were 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, but it's never extinction, right? And uh, for, for us. And I think what we needed was, uh, I think, a more realistic, uh, analysis of what's going to happen, and that will be, you know, things will continue to get worse. We will have an extinction crisis, and then we will try to control um, or you know, ameliorate climate change through something as dangerous as geoengineering. But then people will see that as like a savior technology, even though it will uh, have many flaws and harm many people, especially in the global south. But we will say, oh, at least you know things are better, and then things will continue. And I think. That kind of in-between position between you know some kind of real solution and absolute catastrophe that's kind of like muddling through as things get worse, that is uh, more likely, and I think that should be the the future that we're talking about. And as Drew's saying, we read plenty of books where people kind of hand wave towards. Um, a good society, and we wanted to really figure out uh, you know, what are the planning techniques we have to use and, and what ways do we have to change um, how we produce food or how we produce energy uh, to actually stop mass extinction and the climate crisis and so forth. And to really put some hard numbers on this instead of like, that, these vague uh, proposals that we keep hearing from yeah, Al Gore or even uh, Marxists and so forth, as in I think they, there's a much out, out there in terms of like, a concrete proposal. And I think your use of fiction, albeit very um, data heavy and uh, extensively researched um, fiction is a good way of capturing people's imaginations uh, for what this future could look like, both possible outcomes. Um, and yeah, I think that the emphasis on um, uh, the human race going extinct isn't particularly helpful because if people feel like there's no hope, then they, experience eco-anxiety and you know like they won't want to try to make lifestyle changes or to try and influence policy decisions so I do think that the way that you've gone about it is is much more um optimistic really uh, which is what we need we need more optimism <laughs> well can I also say that I think people actually see the extinction of the humanity as the solution right? They're like oh once we're gone then nature will recover and that's because they can't actually imagine us getting along with each other and with nature, right? And that's the Malthusian side of the of environmental movement. Definitely. So let's um let's dive a bit more into the proposals of half half socialism. So one of the proposals is uh, widespread uh, veganism. Um so plant-based diets or the reduction of consumption of animal products is already growing in popularity, uh, albeit slowly and uh, maybe more in much metropolitan areas in the global north. 
Uh, how could you propose that this would be accelerated and what conflicts do you see that could perhaps arise um, in different places around the world? Do you want me to start, Troy? Yeah, so one of the, the motivation for um, plant-based diets, like this, this uh, large-scale veganism that we propose is because of the scale of the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. Um, uh, something like 80% um, of our agricultural land is taken up by animal agriculture, uh, either pastures or um, growing food to feed to the animals not to people directly. Um, this is very inefficient because animals, you know, eat food to walk around. They don't, they don't want to be eaten, right? So they, they're not, it's not a very inefficient way of transforming calories. Uh, so it's very wasteful in terms of, of land and at least to these monocrop systems, right? Where we grow all this corn and soy to feed to animals. Most soy grown is fed to pigs and chickens, it's not fed to us. Um, and this leads to things like the deforestation of the Amazon is for beef and soy plantations. And that's all basically animal agriculture. Um, so we want to address this. This, this land change is, is causing mass extinction. Uh, it's also causing climate change, the methane emissions from cattle, and then also uh, the land use change uh, causes climate change. It's a, it's a major driver. Um, and a, it's, it's also one of the easiest parts of the environmental crisis to resolve. It doesn't require changing the energy system, which every time you touch it causes inflation and all sorts of madness. And uh, it's, you could be, everyone could be, vegan tomorrow, theoretically, right? I mean, you raise the important strategic question. Um, and as far as um, how we might ha this might happen, um, you're right that there's interest that's growing uh, in plant-based diets and vegan diets, um, but it's not growing fast enough. Um, in, in my personal life, I try and cook people vegan food that's good. Um, I think a lot of the resistance is people think it's just salad, which is, I would also hate that. So I, I can understand this kind of instinctual uh, thing. There's also cultural resources that exist throughout the world. Like I'm from, again, I'm from Alabama. And in my area, there is a long religious tradition called Seventh-day Adventists, and many of them are vegan. And so there are these 100-year-old uh, vegan Southern food traditions. Um, that exist, uh, that can be drawn on that are delicious. And similarly, there are many, you know, monasteries or religious traditions that have these recipes and the communities that follow us. And we also have to remember that most of the peasantry around the world don't eat very much meat at all, like orders of magnitude less than we do in the developed world. So there, there are these latent resources that can be drawn on. Um, it's not something that can, is just imposed, uh, uh, you know, is like a totally modern thing. Um, that's that's some initial thoughts, Troy. I don't know. I'm yeah, sure you have some thoughts to come in on. No, it's it's great. But you know, I think like um, if there was any other, I think sector of the economy where if you changed it, you know, relatively quickly, which you can, and it would, you know, get rid of the extinction and zoonotic, you know, disease problem very quickly, and also get rid of like 20 percent of emissions you know, and then we had all the technology and it would be, it's only a few percent of the economy. If there's anything else like that, we would do it right away, right? But because it's meat, then, oh, you know, it's just like the hardest thing in the world somehow. Like it's just, it's just ridiculous. Like the debate we're having is just incredibly stupid, right? And uh, people are, you know, people are criticizing us for this meat stuff way more than they criticize us for our planning models. I mean, I think planning the world economy is way harder than eating tofu. But I mean, like we have, like, we can't say at the same time, this is the most important problem in the world, you know, mass extinction or climate change and that, but we don't want to change anything at all. And I, I can't, I won't give up my burger. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, right? And I think, uh, as you know, as Drew is saying, I think, you know, every culture, you know, ex except for hunter gatherers or perhaps, you know, very traditional pastoral cultures, they have uh, some kind of uh, tradition of, of, uh, of veganism or vegetarianism. Um, really anywhere you go. I mean, it's really just Northern Europe that kind of sucks for, for you know, vegan or vegetarian food historic, historically, but everyone else is used to, to having the very low meat diets. And, uh, and as, as Drew's saying, pretty much any problem is uh, easier to solve as soon as you get rid of animal agriculture, right? And if, for example, if you want to decarbonize the uh, agricultural system and get rid of, you know, these gigantic fertilizer plants and, and having all these pesticides and having tractors and whatever, it'll, let alone these gigantic plantations for, for maize to feed to animals. If you want to get rid of all that, you know, it's very hard to do that and uh, feed everyone, right? If you still are having lots of meat. So, I mean, there's like a million reasons why you want to get rid of it, plus the ethical reason, right? I think as socialists, we should care 
about the plight of animals. And in, in the book, we get into the utopian socialist tradition, which predates Marxism. And most utopian socialists did care about animals and we're, we're vegetarian, right? So, um, and you can go all the way back to ancient Greek philosophy and they're talking about the animal question and land use and, and all that. So this is, this is old stuff, right? Um, in terms of getting people to actually do it, I think it's just, we have to politicize this, right? We have to make this part of the conversation the same way that we have to say, shut down pipelines and we have to I say no more, you know, uh, no more fossil fuel infrastructure and we have to aim for a society without any fossil fuels. We have to use the same language for, for, uh, for our food system and um, to make arguments against it, I think quickly are very conservative arguments. And the, what we're trying to do in the book is to push the left to think about animals and we're trying to push uh, vegans and animal rights uh, activists to think about socialism, right? And um, the hope is that you have a, uh, several radical groups who will, will see that they have interests in common and that they will get more done than they can by themselves. I guess one thing I, I'm wondering about um, encouraging people to eat plant-based diets is do you think that uh, it needs to be incentivized in some way, like for or disincentivized to eat meat, for example? Because in this country, it's still possible to buy a lot of um, meat and animal products quite cheaply, and so it comes down to issues of food poverty. Um, buying vegetables can be quite a lot more expensive, and things pre-prepared things are cheaper than ha having the time to cook healthy vegetarian meals. Um, and I wonder if there was higher taxation on meat or if it was um, it, if it was treated in the way that very polluting cars are now being treated in the UK, where you're paying higher taxes or you're paying city tax if you're trying to enter uh, the city centre with a polluting car. And so more and more people are using electric or hybrid cars as a result. And I wonder if that could also be a way to tackle diet changes. I'll go first. Yeah. Quick, Don't want to try. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, again, I, I study the history of environmental economics and regulations and all that. And for me, uh, I, I'm generally skeptical of the Peruvian approach of taxing externalities, you know, something like a cigarette tax or an alcohol tax and all that. And I think generally what works best is changing like physical infrastructure, as in if you set up, you know, many uh, community gardens that will produce cheap uh, uh, vegetables for people in the neighborhood. And this is one way to increase that. They also want to set up canteens that will offer, you know, free or very cheap, you know, like subsidized uh, um, you know, vegan food for everyone. I mean, I think the, these are the ways, and they're also like banning products. Uh, you know, if you want to start with like the most uh, environmentally destructive ones or the cruelest ones, like foie gras or something like that. But I think we need to have a political discussion and the goal has to be the total prohibition, right? And that should not be done through, I think, uh, these market mechanisms. Uh, because they you know, yeah, rich people are eating filet mignon that costs a thousand dollars. I think that's still wrong, you know? And, 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 uh, I think we, we need to have you know, these kind of controls and rationing and, and, and again, developing an infrastructure that will support um, working class people. But Drew, uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you're exactly right, Troy, but uh, I will say also that it would go a long way to just eliminate the subsidies for meat, at least in the United States context, which I'm most familiar with. Meat is heavily subsidized. Um, uh, and that's ridiculous. That's insane. Uh, it's a reason why a filet of chicken is cheaper than a block of tofu when the tofu is just the soybeans directly and the chicken is highly inefficiently processed soybeans with suffering involved. It's insane. Um, you know, you would, that would, shifting those around would be a very mild, modest reform. But I think Troy is right that this more radical, you know, uh, we have these food desert problems, right? Like having these uh, affordable subsidized uh, grocery stores or canteens, Troy. Like there was a major 19th century movement for this sort of communal kitchen, right? There was this dream of eliminating the uh, one particular vector of the oppression of women by taking that particular form of housework and, and distributing it. We get restaurants now, uh, which is not the vision, uh, although restaurants are wonderful, of course. But um, but this vision of like, you know, having this this communal place of good, healthy food that's uh, basically free for everyone. Um, that maybe is a dream worth resurrecting. Definitely. Um, so let's move on to uh, energy consumption. 
so this is something that's on a lot of people's minds here in the UK at the moment because we're facing a cost of living crisis, which is in large part due to soaring energy costs um, as we go into winter. And I was wondering, do you think that crises such as these could provide a catalyst for individuals to reduce their energy consumption? And what could this look like going forward? Yeah, you go. Jim. You take it. Oh, okay. okay. I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll start. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting moment that we are in with this high energy costs. Um, I think Troy was right to point out like this idea of like raising costs as a way of changed behavior. This sort of um, is thought of as quite apolitical, right? Like this sort of taxing and then the market takes care of the rest is in practice a way to just make rich people be able to cruise around with gas and have hot nice warm houses in the winter and then poor people who are often renting uh, just don't run their heaters in the winter. Um, uh, that's not a great solution. It'd be great for everyone to do. So like things like, um, it'd be this would be a great moment for a big campaign to get like heat pumps in every house or uh, these retrofitting um, to basically get these highly, highly efficient electrical heating uh, and cooling systems going. I mean, you guys in Britain also had a very hot summer this year, a very brutally hot summer. So taking care of that uh, will also be um, probably important. Um, so these sorts of campaigns um, would be would be useful and that they reduce uh, um, impacts and they could become quite popular potentially in, in the short term. I don't know, Troy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I used to live in the UK and why is the insulation so bad? Why, why are houses built in this insane way in a cold country? I don't really understand it, but... Um, uh, I, again, like I don't think I think when people are saying it has to come down to the individual, one should be wary. I mean, that's not to say that individual individual consumption doesn't matter, but it's that we have to act socially, right? I mean, we have to act collectively, and that means everyone has to change, and that and we have to change how we live, but we have to do it together and make sure we support people as we do that. And I mean, clearly, this could have been a, a great uh, crisis to use as an opportunity to push for like a passive housing mandate, right? And have a gigantic, you know, push for retrofitting, you know, like million homes before the winter. Uh, as Drew's saying, there's many other solutions like, like heat pumps and so forth. Um, I think, you know, and some cities have, you know, built neighborhoods with passive housing, you know, uh, zoning. Um, I mean, this is not this is not like a pie in the sky policy, uh, and that would significantly reduce the need for heating and cooling by around eighty percent, I think, on average. So uh, that, that's the minimum, and and let alone getting away from fossil fuels, right? Like this should be the the time to to get away from that, but also to also focus on like what are the industries that are using up all the energy, right? I mean. Um, maybe a lot of it is for yeah, fertilizer plants or, or maybe a lot of it is for like luxury car you know, construction and all that. And then what we get into the book is that what socialism means for us is to decide collectively of what we're going to do as a society with the resources uh, and the productive capabilities we have. And that means having a set of different plans um, for the whole society and choosing between them. So I think you know, the British people should say, okay, we wanna make sure no one is going to freeze to death this, this winter. How do we do that, right? Like where, where is our energy coming from? You know, what are there ways to reduce? And like actually have that kind of debate at that level. Instead, again, you have a very stupid debate where it's like, oh, well, you know, yeah. I mean, there's always like terrible, uh, um, articles coming out in the British press these days to, you know, to eat less uh, during, like, to skip a meal once in a while is fine, right? During the cost, for the cost of living crisis, or yeah, or go uh, go on a cruise uh, if you don't want to pay your heating bill, or something insane, things like that. That should not be the debate, right? We, we can be doing many other things. Um, and I think I'll say one last thing of that. Like the, the skill or you know what is what is a political skill is to be able to take advantage of crises and environmentalists and the left just have not taken advantage of a crisis in a long time um and instead somehow you know fossil fuel companies are doing well right now right like it's completely insane that we're building more liquid uh, you know, natural gas terminals or where coal mines and coal-fired power plants are being turned on again. It's completely insane this is happening this late. And instead, um, and even when you have like a, a, a Green Party in government in the largest uh, country and you know, most populous country in Europe, like it's just, uh, we're, it, it, we're not 
able to take advantage of these crises and our enemies are because we are not ready with uh, proposals and alternatives, right? Instead, we're just um, caught flat-footed again and again. Yeah, you, you address this in the book, and I think it's important to note that uh, the left and environmentalists aren't taking enough advantage of um, these crises. Um, and in terms of, yeah, in the UK, that we do have things like heat pumps being installed in public buildings, um, but we do have this problem of a lot of our housing stock is, is quite old, and we're having a housing crisis as well. And so the idea of um, installing all of these solutions to our energy crisis is, is all a bit late in the game. Uh, and we're just, yeah, it's just, uh, but I think we should talk a bit more about um, about socialism because it's coming up. It is the it is the title of the book, and it's important to acknowledge that socialism is a bit of a trigger word in U.S. politics, and both parties uh, view it. There are positive and negative perceptions on both sides of party lines. And um, how could we spread the ideals of eco socialism in the current? very polarized political climate that we have in the US and the UK and across much of Europe. I'll go briefly. Us, uh, yeah, go, yeah, go for it, Troy. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, I think uh, the gambit of the book is that the, you know, things are really bad, right? But again, this is an opportunity in some ways for the left and, and environmentalists and other progressive movements. And that, you know, capitalism has never been able to promise you know, so little to so many, right? I mean, no one really believes things are gonna be better in 20 years or you know, 40 years, right? I mean, they, they will be poor, maybe there'll be more inequality. Um, I think Gen Z is extremely radical, uh, it's the most radical generation we've seen in, in ages, uh, because they know that they're screwed, right? And I think, you know, back in like the 60s or the 50s, they, there was this argument that actually things are becoming more equal, you know, working class people can afford uh, a high center of living and all that, and therefore radical uh, solutions are not necessary. And <laughs> this is not the case anymore. Right. I mean, there's it, the economic growth is slowing. There's only just financial bubbles that keep things going, uh, which screws over, I guess, everyone. And if he wants to, to buy a house, uh, for example, um, and he doesn't own any stocks. Um, this is a huge problem. It, the, the environmental crisis will not be solved uh, under capitalism in any humane way. I mean, we're going to have you know, millions of dead climate refugees. Again, if you care about the animal problem, uh, they're not going to solve that you know, mass extinction. So, I mean, this is where the beginning of the book is important for us. We're saying like you know, the, the next 25 years are going to be terrible. Therefore, we have to think about alternatives. And, it's, and that's why when you tell someone, oh, well, vegan socialism or, you know, or rewilding half the world, that sounds completely insane. But like the, you know, what's insane is, is business as usual, right? And I think that, and this is part of, again, the argument of looking at total plans, looking at you know, where is society going and having a, a debate about that. Uh, and that will make certain ideas that seem completely uh, peripheral right now more reasonable. Um, so if you think that having investment uh, being delegated to, to capitalists who are private actors who are competing with one another and they're investing in things that are, are stupid <laughs> because they're profitable, um, is that the way we want to run society or actually we be investing in you know, solar power and, and, and wind turbines and, and uh, you know, public transit, things that are unprofitable, but, but, but we need, right? We need to have that. And how do we have that kind of society? We need to get away from markets and, and look at uh, planning. And so it's, it's, um, I, that's one part of the book. Like basically is that capitalism will definitely destroy the world. <laughs> like we do not believe it's reformable. There's no reason to, th reason, reason to think why it would be reformable. We have to try out something else. Yeah, I'll just add briefly, Troy, you said basically everything I wanted to say, but um, socialism to us means economic democracy. It means the, you know, we have political democracy, at least maybe we do, where we can elect our political leaders, um, but uh, we don't have control over the investment, for example, as Troy was saying. We can all sit here and know that climate change is a crisis, but no one asks me whether whether we should put down gas lines or anything else. Like I don't have a say in this, um, uh, and we don't have this democratic control over the economy. And to us, that is 
what true democracy is, and that is what socialism is. It is this expansion of democracy, this real democracy. Um, uh, and to us, planning is the way that you make this happen. So planning is not the end, it's sort of the means of realizing this sort of democratic vision. And this, this idea of um, big plans, these total plans for society, this is sort of how economic democracy kind of has to work in practice. Um, it's one thing to have like your worker control over your workplace. So I can, we can vote on what our particular workplace does, but that's not really sufficient because, um, you know, if the workers at like a, an electrical utilities plant are in control of that, but that, that impacts everyone, right? Like we all have an interest in how our electricity is produced. So it needs to be more substantial than just having that, that uh, worker, you know, a say in your workplace, like a classic sort of union. Thing. So it's, it's this deeper transformation. That's why we have this idea of debating about visions for how we should go. There's these blueprints for the future. Um, we use the term scientific utopia. So we have many utopias uh, that are kind of rigorously worked out and we can use those as grounds for debate about how much fertilizer do we need? And you know that, that results from maybe how much meat do we want? Um, and that's sort of a, a discussion that we have to have. And I actually think that we'd have a pretty good discussion if we had the real power to do this. Um, it's sort of amazing to see the transformation that comes upon people when they have the power to do something. This is something I've seen in my own, you know, union and workplace, and how people are transformed when, oh yeah, we now have all these millions of dollars uh, to distribute amongst ourselves for benefits or something. And then all of a sudden, the, dem the spirit of the democracy becomes alive in a way that uh, it, it never was otherwise. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of promise there, uh, even though it is a big transformation. So we'll soon open up to the audience for questions, um, but as this is part of a film program, um, I know you already have a, a video game of half a socialism uh, in which people can test out some of these ideas and see how popular they may or may not be. Um, and then, uh, but I wanted to find out how you could imagine uh, the book being adapted into a film or a TV series. Um, yeah, we discussed it a little bit before, but I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so um, as Julie mentioned, we made a video game of the book because we offer our own particular scientific utopia or total plan or a vision of economic democracy. But we make it very clear in the book that there are many other visions. For example, maybe we are skeptical of nuclear, but some people like nuclear energy. So maybe there's a different utopia involving that. And to the end of allowing a full flowering of democracy. We have a video game where you can play as the, in this our imagined economic democracy and try out different solutions. Maybe you can try and keep meat or you can try and abolish it really fast, but maybe you'll make people very mad. Um, so we try and simulate this democratic element um, in the video game. So uh, for what the movie would be, I mean, I think one thing that was nice about the video game is the video game is very different from the book. It's very focused on the form of, of a video game, being able to explore different paths, being very free, uh, to try things and to fail and to do all these things that a video game can do that a book can't. Uh, and movies can do things that books can't do. Um, and it would be very interesting to imagine what might be what might be different. I don't think I would want it to be a documentary um, in a traditional documentary form, although I don't know exactly what I would want it to be. Um, uh, Troy, I don't know, do you have any directorial visions of what our book movie could be if that were to ever happen? Well, I mean, I think the point of, of I mean, they, there's a close relationship between history of socialism and history of cinema, right? Many advances that take place in, in cinema happen in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Bloc countries after World War II. And, and I think that's because uh, cinema for, for socialists was a means to imagine another society, right? And I think this is exactly what we're saying with the game, but with, and with the book as well, is that um, socialism is, is uh, us visually uh, giving uh, utopias, giving projections, and then having debates uh, around these things in a way that is impossible under capitalism. Under capitalism, we can only see what we want and what, you know, our own desires and the economy is something opaque and uh, beyond our control and, and, and so forth, right? So socialism is the reverse of that and cinema is an important part to, to imagine these, these uh, alternatives. Um, there's a, a scholar uh, at SFU in Canada named um, Pavsek, and he is interested in the, the role uh, and the connections between socialism, utopia and, and cinema. And I think um, 
he's I forget which uh, uh, filmmakers he's most interested in is like Godard and a few other ones. But I mean, but I think um, we would want definitely to uh, have a film based on this. And I think it'd be mainly uh, focused on what would this society be like, right? Maybe also how does it come about? What are the revolutionary changes that, you know, what, what kind of movement uh, forms and, and how does it take power and how do different parts of the world then begin to cooperate? And then how, what, what does this life look like? And I think like Di Natura and something like that would be like, what is like a day in the life of this utopia? You know, where like you can, instead of having eco-anxiety and, and, you know, breathing bad air and, ha you know, worrying about another heat wave or whatever, you actually, we live in a society with some kind of ecological stability and, and you know, everyone would have some ecological knowledge and some interest and, and uh, also nature nearby where they can um, wander and, and have fun. And how to, and it'd be similar, I think, as well with uh, the moon and the sledgehammer be like, you know, what, how would we live? Right? What does it look like to have 2000 watts or 4000 watts or whatever we uh, agree upon? You know, what does it look like to live in a, a vegan society? What does it look like to live in a society where most people have empathy for, for animals um, and also have given up on consumerism, have given up on status competition uh, and are participants in the economic democracy that, that is their society in, in a society where everyone is a planner, at least part of the time, right? Like, what does that look like? And I think that would inspire a lot of people to, to work towards that end. So I think cinema would be incredibly important. I mean, for example, um, a friend of mine is a fellow eco-socialist, Andreas Mom, and um, uh, he wrote a book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And uh, he, he criticizes the mainstream environmental movement and says we need to have property destruction as a tactic to, uh, to deal with climate change. And this has attracted the attention of filmmakers. There's a film right now at uh, the Toronto Film Festival based on, on, on his book. Because uh, I think you know, people are looking for something new, right? Uh, things are not working. I think no one really believes in uh, whatever mainstream solutions are going to come from the, you know, from labor or from the Democrats or whatever. So um, the cinema is a, a definitely an important part of this. In terms of like who would make it, I, uh, maybe like Chris Marker, or that would be that would be nice. Um, I don't know. I like Faraki a lot, but uh, who knows? Great, thank you. Um, I think now we have some time for audience questions. Sammy, do we have some questions from the audience? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, thanks, Julia. Um, so yeah, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. So um, if you have any questions, get them in now. But I see there's a few already. Um, uh, so uh, first one um, from Kathy. Uh, there have been many protests. Uh, XR, Just Got Oil, Insulate Britain. A lot of people have been jailed and I think now in the UK we're losing our right to protest. Um, the government is suppressing alternatives and even fracking and other drilling projects are getting through, even though they are heavily contested. So what more can the left do to, yeah, to, put, to, to change things? I think it's really sad in some ways uh, what happened with the Just Stop Oil protests when they were tunneling underneath that, that highway. And I saw on Twitter, um, the people who were under there said, okay, we're stopping our protests. The police you know, uh, chief said, you know, how many inches bad, so we're coming out. And uh, the comments on, on, the, on the Twitter page were just, just incredibly vile. And like most people were incredibly hostile uh, to these people who were, you know, risking life and limb uh, to to do something about about climate change, and I I think it shows you how much work we have to do to reach, uh, you know, as, as at some level like the average person still. I mean, people want to protect themselves. I think they want to protect their their cognitive dissonance. They want to say protesters are hypocritical and oh they're going to McDonald's afterwards or you know they depend on oil too or because then. If these, if these people are hypocritical, then their own hypocrisy is all right, I suppose. Um, I don't know. I think it's it's. I think at some level we have to make you know the great middle you know uncomfortable, more and more uncomfortable. People can't 
go uh, on cruises and just ignore the environmental crisis and just try to, you know, if they have, if they own a home and they are comfortable enough and they don't want to be bothered with society, they have to be made uncomfortable, I think, at some, at some level. I, I, I applaud these activists. I think what they're doing is really important. Uh, Animal um, Rebellion has been doing a lot of amazing things where they've been sabotaging uh, trucks for the dairy industry, which I applaud. I think we need more of these um, actions to make life uncomfortable for, <laughs> for people. And, uh, and that I think at some level, we do need more conflict and more confrontation. Um, and, but at some level, I think also these activists who are doing a great job need to be connected to, um, uh, at some level, perhaps to, uh, to scholars who are trying to understand the environmental crisis and propose these alternatives. As, as people can say, okay, well, we should give up fossil fuels or we should give up meat, but what, what comes after? What, or no, capitalism is the problem, but what comes after? And I think uh, we have to give a convincing answer to that uh, because why should, why should we get rid of markets or capitalism if uh, the alternative is civilizational collapse or something like that, right? Which is, which is not a, a mild concern. Um, and we have to be aware of problems within the environmental movement. I mean, uh, a lot of environmentalists are Malthusian, for instance, a lot of environmentalists, I mean, XR has really bad politics all the time. Unfortunately, they're very like kind to the police and, and, and so forth and, and hostile to socialism. And so we have to do more to bring these movements uh, together. And the fact that you have like, you know, Fridays for the Future, and you know XR and all these groups are actually fighting. You know, like the um, Sunrise. Um, there are all these movements are, are in conflict with each other. Is a problem. We need to create more unity as well. Yeah, I'll just briefly add on that. Um, uh, there's uh, in in chemistry. There's this idea of uh, activation energy, right? Like this arrangement of molecules may have a certain amount of energy, and there's a better arrangement of energy somewhere else that releases energy. But to get there, you have to get over this hump, this activation energy. You have to add energy and then in the end you save it. So you have to break what is there and then you get something better. I think we kind of have a sense that our world is broken and there's something better that we can do. Um, but the problem is, is that what people do have in our current broken world, whether that might be property like a house or a car that allows them freedom to go move around, um, People can cling quite tightly to these things. And I think for reasonable reasons, which is that, you know, there's not a ton to hang on to. And in transforming the world, we might need to challenge these things um, at some point. And that is hard, right? Like there has to, people have to feel like there's something that on the other side that's achievable, right? Like that's really something that we can get to get over this hump um, of transformation of the energy system, a transformation of society, a transformation of the food system, any transformation, however big or small, you have to get over that. Um, and I think that just takes political organization um, and also visions of the future. There's no movement in history that has not had this sort of utopian dream of the future. Robin T.G. Kelly has a whole book about this. Um, I don't think we have a compelling vision of the future right now um, that people believe in. Whereas, for example, in the civil rights movement, there was a vision, many contesting visions, but there was something that people were holding on to, um, and I think helped get over that hump. Great, right, thank you both. Um, uh, next question. Um, this could be for anyone, but Julia, I think this is also one that you may um, have some uh, thoughts on. Uh, do you think that art and film in particular can play a role in helping inspire people engage with environmental issues? Uh, if so, are there any films you think are especially successful? Yeah, I'm happy to start this time because that's why I started No Planet B is that I thought that cinema could be very um, effective in capturing people's imaginations when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, and especially if it's a not necessarily a cold audience, but a warm audience who's interested in learning more. Um, so, for example, uh, I would really recommend The Gleaners and I is a film that Sammy and I discussed before that's related to um, this subject. Uh, so Agnes Varda uh, interviews Gleaners um, in France and they're people who pick up um, 
crops off the field after a harvest, but also those who go to the markets in Paris and, and pick up food off the street. Um, and it really kind of, it is people living on the margins in some ways, but it represents another way of life that's kind of existing on the, on the fringes of capitalist society. Um, so I really recommend that. Um, another film that came out a couple of years ago now is uh, Honeyland, which is about a, a remote bee, um, wild beekeeper. And it really teaches you those principles of taking only what you need and um, allowing nature to replenish. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pass on to, I know we don't have a lot of time left, so I'll pass on to Troy and Drew. Um, the first film that came to mind was um, Princess Mononoke, uh, the Studio Ghibli film, uh, which is a really, really wonderful uh, film about um, environmental crisis. Um, and that really captures, um, I think these these trade offs. There's this sort of a character that embodies modernization. Uh, this um, lady who is doing iron refining or whatever, and she she's able to smash bad medieval hierarchies and give people with maybe leprosy or something this position in society that they were previously outcast. But this this comes at this uh, terrible and unnecessary cost of destroying nature. So it makes people. I think it makes me wonder when I watch it. Is there ways to keep the good of our modern world? Uh, while undoing the bad, which is sort of the puzzle we try and get at in our book. Um, it's a very fun movie. Yeah, Troy. I don't know if I can think of a great environmental... I mean, one film I really liked was um, uh, this... Well, a couple of films I really liked was like nationally, the Canadian National Film Board, uh, you know, it makes some great things. There's one called Uranium, which shows you what it's like to be, you know, downstream of the uranium mine in, in northern Canada. And there's this indigenous reserve there, and they're all just getting super sick, and it's awful. Um, and I think that was so. When people say nuclear is very is great for the environment and all that, they should watch that film. Uh, another thing I really liked, I mean, I love the work of, uh, uh, is Peter Watkins, right? Peter, uh, yeah. So Watkins is amazing. And he made a film about nuclear war and he made it for the BBC. And it's supposed to be like the kind of like, what is it like to go through a nuclear war? And the BBC then didn't show it because it would distress people so much. And I think um, something like that is again like important, um, you know, something, something quite, quite important for for the peace movement. And I think we need to make uh, similar films, uh, both both positive and negative. Uh, great, um, I really like that film as well. Um, I think we have lots more questions, but I think we are out of time really. Um, so uh, that's all I could say, uh, but. I'm going to, I think I'm going to say thank you very much uh, to Julia, uh, Troy, and Drew for joining us this evening. Um, uh, when I was planning this event uh, many months ago, uh, I was really yeah uh, hopeful uh, to get you guys on here, and I'm really pleased that um, I, I, it's happening and become a reality. So yeah, thank you for your time, thank you for uh, this conversation, and thank you for your book as well. Um, uh, could I say, uh, you know, it's been awesome to have this event. Uh, if you could put on maybe our email or at least my email address and uh, people want to reach us, we also have a website at half.earth uh, with information about the book and the game and all that. And I'll be visiting the UK uh, and uh, for the world transformed in Liverpool uh, pretty soon. And then again, for the historical materials conference in London. So if you want to chat, I'm happy to do that. And Drew, I'm sure will come through one time or another. Uh, great. Um, I'll yeah. I'll definitely. I'll put for everyone watching. I'll put um your contact details in the uh, in the chat there. If anyone has any further questions, uh, thanks for that. Um. Well. Uh. And yeah. And we'll put the. I'll put the link to the book in the chat as well. And I'll put the the link to the gaming as well, which you should play. It's very hard. Uh. But uh. Yeah. Good luck trying to plan a uh, plan a feature for you. Uh. I have not succeeded yet. Um, just before we close, uh, I'll just say uh, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. Uh, I hope you can join us for future events on the Cinema of Ideas. Uh, coming up in October, we have the third part of our series of talks with the influential film programmer, curator, and critic Tony Rains about his prestigious career at the cutting edge of independent cinema. 
Hanyang Archivist uh, in November. We'll be holding a panel discussing the Kai Yang with our Like of Way project, a program of new artists' films and archive films examining who has the right to roam in the British countryside. Um, hope to see you there. But uh, that is all we've got time for this evening. So thanks again for watching. Thanks again to you all for joining us. Um, and yeah, have a nice evening, everyone. Goodbye.